Bruce, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Mark. I'm excited to have you on. Uh, like I mentioned in the intro, uh, Bruce is a friend of mine. We've known each other for quite a while. Um, but man, you've got quite the resume and you are uh, an educator. I I'll call you a community leader. I know you're a mentor to, to many, including myself. Uh, and you are, are an author of a new book that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Yeah. Before a little bit of everything. Little yeah. Bit a little everything. bit of everything. <laughs> Before we dive into the book though, um, I'm not going to do your resume justice. So kind of give us a laundry list of kind of your background as well as your dad bio. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, um, um, I guess I would start with, I've been married for 40 years and that's a, that's a great accomplishment for my wife. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, appreciate her patience and diligence for 40 years. Um, you know, I started as an educator. I was an elementary and middle school teacher. I started out in Kimball, South Dakota on the prairies. And my wife from Sioux Falls came to Kimball and like, what is this all about? Wasn't quite sure what that was all about. So we moved back to Sioux Falls and I taught in Harrisburg and then uh, started my first principal job. I was as principal here in a small Catholic school. How a Methodist minister's kid got to be the principal of a Catholic school is probably a story for another day, but uh, went on to uh, did some principal work down in Yankton. And then I had a really neat um, position with the Dakota Westland. I was a chair of the education department, but I shared that position with the Mitchell Public Schools. So I was 70% of my job was with the university, 30% with the school district and had a really interesting shared relationship and did that for a couple of years. And then the vice president for academic affairs left. And uh, so I stepped into that role for about four years um, and went back to be a middle school principal and then I'd been in education for 20 some years and I thought, you know, I was ready for a change. And so I got into the fundraising and foundation uh, work. And so I worked with the Dakota's United Methodist Foundation for about 13 years. And then we were really feeling pulled to come to Sioux Falls. There's this large electromagnet called grandkids. Yeah. And so we uh, came to Sioux Falls and worked here at the University of Sioux Falls for a while, did some national fundraising for the United Methodist Church. And then about a year about a year and a half or so ago, I, I decided to kind of try to semi-retire. And so I started doing some chaplain work with Sanford Hospital, what they call PRN chaplain, as needed chaplain, and which was a, an incredibly interesting and tough and like every adjective that you can think of world. Um, and then a good friend of mine, he's the president of the University of Sioux Falls. He and I uh, taught together, went through doctoral programs. And he said, hey, we have this doctorate in leadership. We want to get this off the ground. Would you come back and help us get off the ground? And so I'm actually back pretending to work again at the University of Sioux Falls. And, and we got our first cohort off in June. And we're starting to build the, the next cohort, which will start um, the summer, June of 2022. So that's kind of my work background. I also have started a consulting company called Pathvisor Consulting. Um, just to work with leadership consulting. I've, I've worked with some pastors and churches and some nonprofits. Honestly, I've not been able to build that resume very or that, that business very strongly because I'm, I'm working and doing other things. So, um, and also we have a, a ministry in Haiti. Who I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh, it's called Laganava Live. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that. That's kind of what fills my free time. Um, so we have two boys. Our oldest son is here and actually uh, worked with Mark for a little bit. He's in, in digital right. advertising, digital marketing stuff. Uh, and his wife and his and our two grandkids are here in Sioux Falls. So really blessed to be close to them and part of our life, part of their lives. And, and in fact, my granddaughter and I will be going to hockey tomorrow night and the Stampede game. So cool. love, love being part of their lives. And then our youngest son is out in San Diego and he works for Amazon Fresh. And, uh, you know, if you don't live close, you might as well live in San Diego. It's not a terrible place to have to go visit. Sure. In fact, we just did a family vacation out there a few weeks ago and really just had a, you know, wonderful time along the, along the ocean. So that's kind of my, my, my resume of my life here. Good grief, man. My head is spinning. That's a lot. <laughs> well, my wife says I can't hold a job and I guess I've pro proven that through my lifetime. So, uh, that's, that's enough on your plate that most people would the idea of writing a book uh, would not even pass one's mind, but you've not only written one, you've written two. Yeah, you know, I was working for a national United Methodist organization. Um, I was uh, raising funds for scholarships for United Methodist colleges on a national level. And I literally was from Alaska to Florida and Maine to California. And I was spending a lot of time, you know, in hotels and, and uh, 
airplanes and, and alone time. And I thought, you know, I need a more productive use of my time than just watching soap operas. And so the, the United Methodist Publishing, uh, the organization I work for has a publishing house. And so I pitched them this idea of a book on grace. Um, John Wesley has some really interesting views on grace. And so I wrote that book um, a couple of years ago, and I, I use all the profits from our book to support our ministry in Haiti. And so it was a really great way to kick that off. Um, and so that book was published, I think it was about three years ago now. And then this last summer, um, kind of in that semi-retirement time, I, I pitched a second book to them on the Holy Spirit and, and they, they bought it. And so uh, I put together in about three months, actually put together a book on the Holy Spirit. And that just was published in August. And again, using the profits from the book and really so way to kind of get um, our ministry out in front of people and, and, and possibly raise some funds for our ministry in Haiti. Well, um, yeah, I want to dive into your, your uh, what you've got going on in Haiti, but let's, let's dive into this new book, Mighty Winds and Gentle Whispers, The Purpose and Power of the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm really intrigued by this because I think on one hand, People feel like they have a good understanding of the Holy Spirit. And I'm talking like, you know, Christians who are, you know, kind of raised in the church and whatnot, um, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, and we when we get it. But on the other side of the coin, I feel like there's a lot of aspects to the Holy Spirit that people don't think about or maybe take for granted. And and for sure, people who are new to Christianity, the idea of the Holy Spirit is, I think, pretty unique and really in many cases hard to wrap your head around the fact that you know god is this is this um triune right being yeah. and um so let's unpack this let's uh i yeah. think like i said most people probably have most people listening anyway probably have a good grasp of the holy spirit but for those who may not because i know that we do have some i'll call them baby christians who tune yeah. in from time to time give us kind of what is the holy spirit you know, I will, I'll just say, really, the, the book came about because of, of a sermon series that our pastor did, and he did a sermon series on the Holy Spirit, and I thought, you know, I've heard the Holy Spirit my entire life. I mean, I've, I've been, my dad's the United Methodist, retired United Methodist pastor. I grew up in the church. Um, I, I, you know, like a lot of people kind of walked away from the church and came back to the church, but I've heard the Holy Spirit my entire life. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, Spirit yeah. of God, Spirit has been part of it, but I thought, I really don't know what the Holy Spirit is. I don't have a relationship with that, with the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the things that was really a, a, a discovery for me was, is to think about the Holy Spirit as a person, um, that it is another aspect of God. And, you know, in my book, I talk about thinking about water. I mean, you have water as a liquid, water as steam, water, uh, you know, as I, in, as a solid kind of Jesus, or like God is the same way that God is God, God is Jesus, and God is the Holy Spirit. And as I began to, you know, dig into it more, I just find, found out how full the scriptures are about the Spirit, and how the Spirit really um, moves in our lives, and really is the, I think, kind of like the actionable part of God. It's, um, it's like, you know, God sent Jesus for a period of time, that resurrection really created Christianity, you know, because we believe that that Christ rose from the dead, that created Christianity and proved that that was God. But then how do we sort of find that action in our lives right now? And I think that action comes through the Holy Spirit. And that's where I think God sends those mighty winds, but also at times sends, sends those gentle whispers. It's the, it's the call from a friend. It's an email. It's a, something you read in a book or a sermon you listen to and you went, wow, that really hit me at that time. I, I've come to believe that that's the Holy Spirit and that that's the Holy Spirit working through us. The other thing I would just say about that was really neat for me was I reached out to some pastors and some friends and just said, hey, you know, I, I really need some examples and personal stories of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was all about that. I mean, it, the, the right story came at the right time. And so just throughout my book, there's some just awesome, moving, powerful stories about people and their interaction with the Holy Spirit, really listening to the Holy Spirit, responding to the Holy Spirit, um, because I think we get those nudges all the time. And I think God is reaching out to us all the time, but we don't always listen, we don't always hear, we don't always respond. And so I have these listen, hear, and respond stories through there and use a lot of 
lot of great examples or people who listened to the Holy Spirit, heard the Holy Spirit, and then responded to the Holy Spirit. So kind of a long way around saying is I think it's kind of the action part of God. I think it's what moves us in our life. I think of the nudges that we receive. Um, you know, and kind of reflecting back to my book on grace, you know, John Wesley's view of grace is there's this thing called prevenient grace, which is grace that's out there and it's always pulling us back. So even if we're, we've walked away from God, even if we don't have God as, in, as, as, as uh, intimate in our lives, that there's always that nudge and that pull to come back to God and, and that grace and that, that action of the Holy Spirit is, I think, really what, what we need to be listening for is those mighty winds, but also the gentle whispers. And then we, what we do is really, like my title says, we find the power and purpose of the Holy Spirit. Mm. You touched on a lot there. Um, I think I like the, the uh, comparison to, I don't know if you said this or not, but this is the, what popped into my head, like God's energy, God's yeah. action. You said action, like, right. you know, the Bible referred to him, referred to the spirit as, um, the helper, right? Jesus right. had to leave so the helper could come and, and yeah, he's, he's like doing God's, uh, work for lack of a better description. So, um, I think that, and I'm speaking for myself now that, uh, and I think I can speak on behalf of a lot of guys listening that, um, even if we are familiar and we, we grasp, what the Holy Spirit is, who it is, uh, listening to the Spirit in the moment right. is where a lot of people stumble, including myself. Right, right. So what did you discover about, or are there some some, some uh, practical things that we can employ in our lives that can help us get better about listening to the Spirit in the moment? Yeah. You know, I, I honestly think um, it starts with prayer. And I think, you know, I just think that, we need to continually make prayer a part of our lives because not only are you visiting and talking with God about the things that are happening in your life, you're also providing some quiet time to listen for God to speak into our life. And so um, there's a, an author that said, you know, if we're not praying all the time, we're, you know, we're, we just need to be praying all the time about everything in our lives. And so simple things, when the person cuts you off in front of in traffic, you pray for them. And then when the person you know, the, the, when you, when you maybe are angry about things, maybe bring that to God. And so I just think, I think it really starts with prayer and making that a really integral part of your life, because to me, prayer is, is talking with God, but it's also listening to God and spending time listening. And so, and then, you know, obviously spending more time in scripture. Um, when I'm more diligent about reading scripture, I allow God to speak through me. I think reading things, listening to podcasts, those kinds of things to sermons, listening to others, let them speak into your lives. I think those are really practical ways of, of just saying, hey, how do I begin this process? Well, spend some time looking for God and listening to God. Um, because this book was written by United Methodist um, you know, Publishing House, it's, a lot of it is, has John Wesley. And if you don't know about John Wesley, he's really an, an incredible evangelist. I mean, back in the 1800s, they, they calculated that he put like 250,000 miles on in his ministry. And that's by, you know, on horseback and on foot, and he would preach three times a day. But John Wesley's journey really reflects my journey. And I think it's important to remember that everybody's journey is different. For example, he, he didn't have this powerful Christian moment where like many people can say, I, I gave my life to Christ on this day. This is the day that was, you know, was a powerful time in my life. I don't have that. And neither did John Wesley. John Wesley talked about, you know, that his heart was strangely warmed. And I would say that reflects me is that I, I'd been in church, I'd been, I knew the words, I'd been part of that, but it all of a sudden it was like, it was part of my life. And I knew that I wanted to have Christ as part of my life. So my, my heart was strangely warmed. Um, the other part is that the Holy Spirit came to John Wesley later in his ministry. And so he didn't really have a full understanding of the Holy Spirit to, Spirit to later in his ministry. And that reflects me. I mean, I, I'm old. And I, I feel like, you know, I haven't really dealt in and jumped into what the Holy Spirit means in my life. The other thing is John Wesley's ministry wasn't always successful. And I feel that way about my life. It hasn't been always, I haven't always been successful. And the, and the last thing is that he went through periods of doubt. And I still do as a, as a lifetime Christian, I still have periods of doubt where I feel like, man, there's times I am on it. I feel like I'm really one with God. I feel like I'm really engaged. 
And there's times I'm like, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure. I still question at this point. And, and I think sometimes it's okay, especially for guys to hear that doubt has been part of my journey, but I think it's been one of the most powerful parts of my journey because in my doubt is when I question and then I put things back into order for myself. And so when I go through that series of doubt, I think it's made me a, more, a stronger Christian. And, and I think guys need to hear that, that it's, it's, it's a journey. It's not yeah. a definition that you reach and like, oh, got it, I'm done. It's, it's a lifetime journey. It's exploration. It's prayer. It's reading scripture. It's listening to podcasts and reading good things and listening to great sermons. But it's going to, doubt is going to be part of that journey. Um, and it's walking through that doubt and not giving up and reaching out to try to find find others and groups and small groups or whatever to help you through that. I think you it's know. one of the most powerful ways to develop your your journey uh, toward the Holy Spirit, towards grace, and towards Jesus. And I can relate to so much of what you just said. I've always been jealous is the wrong word, but um, I'll, I'll use the word jealous. People who have, you know, those moments where they drop to their knees, they ask, God to come into their life right. and the Holy spirit just right. comes upon them and their lives are changed like that. Like, I don't have a story like that. Right. Um, and uh, again, I'm, I've always been kind of jealous to people uh, of people who can point to a specific point in time that says, right. you know, this is when God came into my life and changed right. everything. Um, I, so I like the, the metaphor of like slowly warming because that that's been me. I grew up in the church and um, I want to go back to, this idea, and I've touched on this on the show before, but I think it's such a critical point and so many guys struggle with it. And that is intentionally listening, being still, being quiet, because right. it's easy to say, oh yeah, you know, pray and, and listen to God. But in today's culture, we're so busy, not right. necessarily productive, but busy. Yeah. And I think Satan wants us busy, too busy to yeah. take time to listen to God. It's one thing to say a quick prayer, you know, when you're in the car or what, whatever, you know, wherever it might be when you happen to say a prayer, it's usually when we need something, but then to like actually <laughs> stop and listen to what he has to say in return. I think that's where we stumble. That's yeah. where I stumble. I call it the Amazon God. It's like, you know, here, God, I have this list of things I want. I want you to deliver that as soon as you can. And by tomorrow, be good. You know, it's kind of <laughs> right. God and, um, and, and I just don't think God works that way, you know, no. um, you know, and you know, and I think like for me, I've really started bike riding more. Um, so, you know, that's an hour that no one bugs me. I, I'm out there and I, I can't, I mean, when I honestly, when I get stuck in my book, I go for a bike ride and mm -hmm. I'm like, God speaks to me. And I just like, things come to me on a bike ride. And so um, I've spent a couple times in, in a, in a, um, well, it's used to be called blue cloud Abbey. It's, a, you know, it's a, um, not a convent. What's that? What's it? A monastery. It's okay. a, you know, it used to be a monastery. It's not a retreat center. Maybe it's a long walk. Maybe it's a drive, you know, to the Black Hills, whatever it is, you need to have some intentional time where maybe it's on the golf course. I don't, but you have to have some no. intentional time where it's you you put your phone away. Uh, you don't have access to social media. You're just, you're there in quiet. And I'll, I'll tell you, I can't, I can't count the number of times that God's spoken to me in just like, Oh, that's it. That's, that's, you know, that's where I need to go. That's how I resolve this thing. I, I, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me on a bike ride or on a, on a walk or just somewhere away from the day to day, away from our phones, mm -hmm. away from the business of our, of our lives. hundred percent. And I think that, you know, kind of going back to the idea of exercise in particular, I, I know so many guys who that's when they feel like they're closest to God is when they're running biking, yeah lifting right. weights on the golf course, like you said, but by yourself, don't be golfing with the yeah, exactly. guys, exactly. friends. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I just think we, we have to be really intentional about it because, you know, and, you know, even schedule it, you know, whatever it takes, yeah. whatever you find that's, that's, you know, helpful for you, just find some time away from everything and, and schedule. I think it's, it's time where, where God, you allow God to speak to you. Um, and I think we all need to build that, build that into our lives. So again, putting myself in the shoes of somebody who's maybe not as familiar with the Holy Spirit as um, others who are listening, when we pray, are we praying to God? Or are we praying to the Holy Spirit? Or are we praying to Jesus? Who are we praying to? 
You know, I think all of the above, you know, I think there's times when we just, we want some action in our life. And to me, that's sort of like praying to the Holy Spirit. And I think when, when we're, I don't know, when I pray for others, I tend to pray for God, to God, to, you know, and um, to, to bring, you know, be a part of their path, especially with health issues. Um, I don't always pray for, you know, healing as much as I, as I pray for God to be with them and be with the family and surround mm -hmm. them, let God's presence be known with them. And I guess when I think of when I need examples in my life, then that's Jesus. I mean, Jesus was the example of how we can live that out. So I guess kind of it's part of um, part of what, you know, what I'm asking for is kind of who I pray to. But but I think it's I think it's still God, you know, that even it's God in three parts. And so, um, I, you know, I tell people, don't worry as much about the mechanics of prayer. Just talk. Um, mm -hmm. Just just open your heart to God. Say what you want to say. God, God can handle it. Um, you know, God's heard it. And so don't worry about the mechanics uh, as much as just being open to God and, and, and talking with God and saying, what do I need? What do, what's going on in my life? How can God, you can help me. And I, and I do think there are times when we need to be more specific about saying, Hey, I need this in my life. I need a better relationship with my kids. I need a, I need someone to, you know, intervene in this situation. I think sometimes we need to talk to God about, some specific things that we need in our life. Um, I think it's, it's some, somewhat dependent on, on what I'm asking for, but I think just don't worry about the mechanics as much as just spending time with God. Yeah. Do you, and I guess this is a question for you personally, or maybe through stories in the book. Um, but do you think that the, the spirit is ever like intentionally absent? Hmm. As a test, I guess, is my, my real question. I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I, I feel like we get tested from the evil one, we don't, that we don't get tested from God. Um, that I think God is, is a, a God of love and always wants the best in our best for us. I feel like when, when I feel tempted or I feel like it's, there's something absent, I, I, I don't feel like that's God in my life. I feel like God is always on our side and pulling for us. Do we always listen? No. Do we always respond the right way? No. Does it, things always work perfect when it, life? No. Um, but I do feel like God's always the goodness that I go back to. Um, when someone's really ill, I, I can't pray for healing as much as I can pray for God to be part of their life and be part of their doctor's lives and the, the other yeah, best care they can probably give, uh, that they can give. Will miracles happen? Yeah, but I can't always guarantee that. And so I don't know how God works exactly. Um, so I guess I just pray for that presence and the goodness of God to, to overcome the evil and the, the, the bad stuff that happens in our lives. Yeah. Have you found, again, in your own parenting journey, as well as um, stories that you've collected, um, is there a right or a wrong way of introducing our children to the concept of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I think, I think one of the hardest things is, you know, we, my dad's a pastor, I came out of that background, I definitely walked away from the church for a while and came back. And so I, I think to me, it's sort of that I live under that provenient grace that, that we continue to pray for our kids, we continue to pray that God will continue to put the right people in their lives and and have the right nudges and put, that they'll respond to when God, you know, is reaching out to them. Um, we can only control ourselves. We can only control how we interact. And I think kind of laying those things out for, for them and being open to them. Um, you know, I've had I have conversations with one of my sons who's not as really a, a believer. And so, and I, I lay that out for him saying, this is, this is what I think has happened in my path. This is why I believe um, I'm not going to judge you because I understand why people don't believe. I'll be honest with you. You know, I've, I've had my long periods of doubt and I understand why people don't believe. Um, but here's the things that have happened in my life. Here's where I believe the Holy Spirit has responded, you know, and, and kind of talking about stories in my book. I mean, here's, you know, just the ones that come to mind. There's a woman who saw this, uh, another woman at a, at a gas station and she just had this, she said, just felt, felt like the spirit talked to her. And here's a woman he, she rescued from human trafficking. And I mean, it's just an incredible story where she, just because she saw this woman respond to the Holy Spirit, saved her from human trafficking. There's, there's two families that came joined um, by this 
both families had incredible tra tragedies and just these layers of like, of where, where God connected those two families. Um, we have a, a friend of mine who had a, a tragedy in their family and a, an unexpected visitor came to their door and it was a person that they had, they knew was not going to speak goodness into their life. And all of a sudden this, they just, they were just, uh, I don't even know how to say it. They didn't really want this person in their life or in their family at that time. And he asked if he could pray for them because he knew that they were going through a hard time. And so I just think it's being open to those times where the unexpected might happen and that where the Holy Spirit will come to us in unexpected ways if we just are available and open to, to receiving the Spirit. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. So um, how do people... How can they, how can somebody be sure that what they're hearing is the Holy spirit and not yeah. temptation yeah. from somebody else? Cause I've, I've had those moments. I'll, I actually will use this podcast as an example. Um, yeah. earlier this year, I felt this and it kind of came out of nowhere, but I kind of felt this, this, um, uh, like it was time to bring the podcast to an end. Like it was time for me to shut it down. Yeah. And initially I thought, well, this is the devil trying to get me to stop doing something that's sure. good. But then I had other people kind of that I, that I knew and trusted uh, and who are believers um, kind of speak into me from an opposite perspective. So it was like, I was really conflicted and I was like, well, how do I know whether it's the Holy spirit talking to me or right. something else? I was trying to find the quote in my book, but, you know, because you know, if you read the story in Acts, I mean, the, the, the Holy Spirit came to this group of people in a very powerful way, you know, with, with the winds and so forth. But this, there's a quote in my book where that most often the Spirit will come to you in a whisper. And that with time and with experience and listening more, we learn to understand, is it, is it, is it the Holy Spirit or is it just something that came to my mind? And and I think it's important that we, we ask the Holy Spirit to intervene in our life and say, I need you now, I need you. But I think what, what the quote basically says to us, expect it to come as a whisper. Mm -hmm. Expect it to come in an un, unexpected way. Maybe a friend, like, you know, like, like something you emailed to me and I'm like, oh man, I really needed that at that time. You know, I say this a lot. I just like, when something comes to my mind now, I pray for that person and I really try to reach out to them. I try to send them a text or an email I try to call them, whatever. And I can't tell you how many times people said, man, something was going on in my life. I needed that call today. I needed that text today. That to me is responding to the Holy Spirit. And I think, I think the more that we respond, the more we're able to understand when it is the Holy Spirit. I mean, if, I, if someone comes to mind and I call them, they said, man, I needed that call today. This is what was going on in my life. How can that not be the Holy Spirit? You know, I, yeah. that, that, that didn't come to, I didn't like, I didn't think of Mark today that Mark popped into my mind. And then I responded to that to me. I, there, there's no other way to, re, to, to um, say that, it, that that's anything but the spirit. Um, and so I think it's living a life of response that, you know, and, and the simplest thing is when someone comes to your mind, pray for them and then call them, send them a text, shoot them an email said, Hey, I was just thinking about you today. And I can't tell you how many times people have said, man, something was going on. I really needed that at that time. Well, to me, that's a, that's a Holy spirit moment. Yeah. And you never know how important or how much a phone call can mean to somebody. You don't know what they're going through. And one simple phone call could literally be the difference between life and death sometimes. You know, and guys, we aren't the best at communicating. I mean, you know, like, you know, if you had, we had two boys, I mean, you learned how to interpret grunts and groans and that kind of stuff. I mean, guys are terrible about that. So, you know, I find a group, like we have a men's group that meets on Saturday morning at 730, find a group or a good friend that you're going to have coffee with, um, have someone in your life that you can, you can reach out to. And then, you know, respond to those things. Even you'll think it might be stupid. You might be saying, well, 
I'm not going to call him. Well, do it. I'm going to respond to him. Send him a text. You're going to find out that there are people that come to you and that they needed to hear you. Hear you. And, I, and I do believe there are times when it literally is life or death, that people are on their way to do something that they probably would harm themselves and somebody yeah. intervened. Somebody made a difference. So I think that's worth a text. I think that's worth an email. And I think that that could that could make a difference. So for a non-believer, would you say that the Holy Spirit would be the same as what somebody, what a non-believer might consider to be just like their conscience? Talking yeah, to them? intuition. They might say it's intuition, intuition or it's, you know, it's um, circumstances. That Sixth goes, sense or something yeah, like that. Right. And I think, you know, and I, I get that. But when that many instances happen so often and you're like, there's got to be something more than that. It can't, it couldn't have that many instances, that many circumstances happen in a role. I mean, and then that's where, that's where my belief comes from is like, um, I, it, that that's, there was too much circumstance in the, in that series of events to, to be God or to not be God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that at least I'm speaking, I'm from my uh, own perspective to live that life of response requires you to be comfortable being uncomfortable Absolutely. because it, it, yeah. it, most often when you are responding to the Holy spirit, it's, you're, you're being called to do something that you don't necessarily want to do or would do normally. And that could be like, like you said, just uh, calling somebody who maybe you don't typically call, you know, a phone call from you is maybe a little bit strange, but um, other times, and this is, this happened to me uh, recently. Um, I was at an event where we were helping move some furniture and I was talking to a guy that I had been in a small group with before. And we just kind of got, uh, talking as we were working and he divulged some things that had been going on in his life and, and he got emotional and cause it's pretty significant stuff. And I just felt called to pray for him. And I am not one of those guys. Like I'm not, yeah, I pray in the, in, in a quiet room by myself, you know, I'm not the guy who like in the middle of a crowded room or whatever is like, let's pray together. Like that's not me. Um, but I, I wish it was me, but it's just not, but I just yeah. felt called to pray for this guy in this moment. And I didn't know what to say. And I just started praying and, it, and the words just kind of came to me I know. and I'm not lifting myself up. Cause again, I got a lot of work to oh. do in this area, but no. I think that that is one tiny example of when you feel that right. tinge right. of needing to do something, just do it. Yeah, exactly. You know, some of that I work in the is in as a chaplain really kind of pushed me, Lord. Like, you know, you get involved with some very difficult, you know, very life threatening kind of events for families, and so you get thrown into really high pressure um, emotional situations, and then you're asked to pray, and you're like, so that has helped me sort of sort through that. Um, and really, most of the time, it's really not the words you say; it's your presence. And it's your caring attitude. It's your interest. They're not going to remember a word of your prayer. What they're going to remember is they were here with me. They walked with me. And that, I would say the same thing about the guy you're with. He, can't, he won't be able to tell you a word that you prayed for him, but he will remember that you walked with him. You prayed for him at a, at a difficult time. You know, and, you know, the same thing of our Haiti ministry. I just, I can't tell you how many times, like something would, has moved us in the right direction. You know, we've made a right connection and, and, you know, I, I, I say this in my book and I've said it a lot, I'm really good about seeing God in the rear view mirror and yeah. I'm not as good as seeing God in the, in the windshield. And my, my goal for my life is starting to see God in the windshield and not, and now I look back and like, Oh, wow, God was a way of all part of that whole thing. And so my, my goal for my life is start seeing God and expecting God to be in front of me and to be part of where I'm going, not always a part of, Oh yeah, I guess that was God. Thanks God. You know? Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to become more of a windshield person than a rear view mirror person. <laughs> well, and I think there's value in both, right? I mean, being oh, yeah. able to connect the dots in the rear view mirror and, and being able to, to see, oh, God was at work in all of these things in my life in the past give, allows you to have more faith in terms of expecting him at the, the, the windshield, so to speak. Um, yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I had another thought there and I just lost it. But um, going back to the idea of like, listening to the spirit almost takes practice. I heard somewhere, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher the, 
the reference, and I wish I remember where I heard this. It might have been another author. But when it comes to knowing God's voice or the Holy Spirit, they equate it to um, a child knowing its parents' voice. And so when if a child gets lost in the store, uh, if the parent is one or two aisles away and, you know, they hear their child calling out and, and the mom or the dad says, I'm over here, you know, little Johnny or whatever they can, they can find their way back because they know the voice. That's a great, yeah, that's a great image. And so it's like that with God. If we, if we know his voice, then we can find our way back to him or we can respond to the call. But if we don't know his voice, right. um, when we do hear it, we, we don't know whether it's God or somebody else, like I was saying earlier. So oh, that's a great talking image. to myself in the mirror right now. Yeah. But. <laughs> no, that's a great image. Because if the kid yells out, mom, there's also, there's 30 other moms in the store. Right. But the one mom knows, you know, that's my kid, you know? And yeah. so I, that's a great image. I love that. image. But to, but to know his voice, we've got to read the word. Right. Right. Cause that's God speaking to us. So the more we read the word, the better we understand his voice. And so that, yeah. and, and, you know, and, you know, spending time in prayer and, you know, finding small group, getting in, you know, ha- listening to sermons, all, all those are, are just pieces of the puzzle and we're going to have ups and downs, but that's, that's, it's part of the puzzle and it's part of that journey that we, we continually go through. So you mentioned small groups. Um, I'm in a couple myself and I know that guys tend to not want to dive into this stuff necessarily. We kind of tiptoe around it. Have you found a good way a to approach topics like this with other men. Yeah. You know I'm saying? You know, yeah. You know, um, I would say like, it takes time. Um, yeah. And I think, I think men are, are more comfortable in groups with just men. Um, so it's been kind of a, an interest of mine to always have a men's group. I have been part of men's group um, just men, because I, when you, when you even have our own spouses, you know, and I've been with my spouse 40 years, you know, it's not like we have secrets from another, but it's just different. We share differently when men are, when women are in the group. So I'd encourage you to find another man that you can go have coffee with, or go on a bike ride with, or go play golf with just you. I mean, years ago, I, my best friend died of cancer about seven years ago. And, and I, he truly was my best friend. I mean, we mm-hmm. like, We'd go up to twins games. We'd do stuff together. We would have battles with each other, and we'd we'd uh, we'd laugh together, and we'd always come away just in a deeper appreciation for each other. And so that's a special thing. And it, you know, you I really realize now of having not him having Rob around for seven years how special that relationship is. And guys, it's harder for us to do that to find that relationship. But I also think it is probably the most important thing we can do in our life is find a male mentor or, or friend um, that can give us some feedback about what we do. Because we process things differently than women. Yeah. We see the world differently. We're not as smart as women. We just, you know, we just kind of plow through the world and we need someone in our life to like give us, to be that mirror for us and reflect back to us saying, hey, these are the things that I'm so, so appreciative about your life. And here's some things that we both need to work on. I, I think guys need another guy. And, you know, that's why I appreciate your, your ministry of, you know, mm-hmm. is really to reach guys uh, because I, I, I see the same thing. I think I see that need where guys are searching for that something else. Um, it, and they're not going to find it in a big car. They're not going to find it in the big job. They're not going to find it in the best suit. They're going to find it in a relationship with another person. And often that the strongest relationship they can build is with another guy. Yeah, hundred percent. And if we have other men in our circle who are strong believers themselves, the, the spirit can speak to us through them. Yeah. 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 And it, it just like this, the group that we have, we, we, and, and if people are interested, let me know because we're, we're always adding other people, but it's, we do it on zoom and, and some meet in, in person. And so the, you know, so some people always zoom into the meeting because we have people from different places and it's, you know, we spend a lot of time just sharing and laughing about our lives and what's going on. And then we jump into the word for a while and then we jump back out and, and we're on a text group. And so something comes up that that group is like the first group to respond, like, Hey, uh, we have a guy in our group whose dad is not doing very well right now. The guy was just blowing up last night. Hey, we're praying for you, thinking about you and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's just nice to have that, you know, kind of like, Hey, here's 20 guys I know. And we don't, you know, that will be praying for me or yeah. will understand if something's going on in my life or, or, or 
something goofy funny happens we also throw that out in the group too and you know it's just ha- it's just having that that group that we know will respond and, and care for us it's important it's extremely important and you don't realize how important it is until you're in a situation where you yeah. you don't have that you almost the sense of hopelessness is that much heavier on your heart and your spirit but when you know you've got a, a an army of prayer warriors kind of at your yeah. side it helps and what do guys do we usually internalize it and so then that tr- that comes out in anger or it comes out in you know, our being angry with our kids or our spouse, or it comes out in, you know, in, in bad ways. And so we usually swallow that. And so instead of coming out in healthy ways, it comes out in unhealthy ways. Yeah. Well, um, this is a, I want to read this book. So you need to get me a copy first yeah, of all. Yeah, um, <laughs> do that. I think okay. it's, uh, I think it's needed. What's that? Well, I just want to talk about, you know, too, like a little bit about our Haiti ministry, you know, yeah, so, that's where I was going to go next. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, just, I don't know how much time you have, but just to give you the brief, you know, summary of this. In 2008, we went to this island. There's a little island out in Haiti it's called Laganov. And so we met, it's just out on the coast of Haiti. And we met this young man, his name was William. He was an orphan. Uh, and his, he was actually living with a pastor and he had this dream of becoming a doctor. Mm. So we kind of came back and tried to pray for a way to get him to medical school. And our church started to support him in medical school. In 2010, we were actually on the island during the big earthquake there. And so um, he was with us during that time. You experienced the earthquake yourself? Yeah, we were there during the big earthquake. And so so his medical school collapsed. A lot of his friends and professors were killed. And and we... uh, you know, we just tried to figure out a, a way to, to get him in medical school. So he decided that he wanted to go to the Dominican Republic where he like had, you know, no place to live. And, and by the way, you're going to have to learn another language because they speak Spanish in the Dominican, all that kind of stuff. So then I went back to, to this island in 2011. I just interviewed pastors, leaders, all kinds of people. And I just said, hey, if we could help, what, what do you need? And it came back overwhelmingly. We needed support in the areas of education, healthcare, and how difficult life is for women, children, and the elderly. And so that's our that's been our focus. Um, we now have a school. It's a two level school, grades one through seven. Um, we have twenty some people that work in our school that we pay every month and just have so they can find a way. Um, we have a health center in our school, so largely to to help the elderly people. We have uh, Dr. William came back to the islands. We have a clinic, couple of clinics. We do these mobile clinics. Where we're going out and, and finding in kind of the remote parts of this island where, where people have no health uh, access to health care. And then we just support women, children, and the elderly. We have some feeding programs. We have a large Christmas program. Uh, you know, we started just tiny. We started small and it has grown way beyond where I've ever, ever would have imagined. Um, so in 2013, we set up this nonprofit called Laganov Alive. And we donate all the profits from our from the book. Anytime I go to speak, if I preach in a church and I get paid an honorarium, I just donate that all to our ministry. And so uh, we just really have, like it's it's provided me a way to to provide some funds for our ministry there. But also it's it provided me some also some really great stories. You know, some incredible stories of where God has has really spoken through us and and really provided us the right direction at the right time and. You know, I say this in my book, but I, I can't tell you how many times, I, you know, something has come up and I thought, I have no idea how we're going to pay for that. And a check shows up, you know, uh, last night I get a call from a good friend of ours he said, you know, we've, we've been giving to this one organization for a long time. We just, we just want to, we just felt called to give that money to you. So we're going to switch our gift. We're going to give you a gift. Now we're going to do a monthly gift to our organization. We're like, wow. You know, what, do I, how do I answer that? Yeah. Um, so though we've had some incredible Holy Spirit moments um, happen through our ministry. And so if they get, if you get a, you can get the book from, you know, the typical sources, you know, Amazon, whatever. But if you get the book through me, I, I get the books at an author's rate and then I donate the difference. And okay. so, so if you go to brucebloomer.com um, and you can probably put that in the show notes, if you just go yeah. to brucebloomer.com you know, it has all the information, but I encourage you to get the book through me because then I, again, I donate the difference to our, to our ministry. I actually don't get any money if it's sold on Amazon or Crossroads has my book and, and some other Cokesbury and some other place have my book, but I don't actually get any money from that. That goes back to our publisher. Okay. And so 
again, I get books at an author's rate and then I just donate the difference. Okay. Well, we will link to that in the show notes and you just beat me to the punch with the, my next two or three questions there as you dove into your, uh, your ministry. Yeah. Um, guys, I encourage you to check out this book. I think that despite what you think, you know, about the Holy spirit, you can always learn more. And I think that this book could be a good resource. So, uh, definitely check out the book, uh, mighty winds and gentle whispers, as well as your other book, which we didn't really touch on simply grace. Both of those, the proceeds go to the, say the name of the organization one more time. Yeah. Laganov. It's it, Laganov is the name of the Island. So it's Laganov alive. And I could give you the, you know, the spelling of that. It's, it's, L A G O N A V E. So uh -huh. it's, you know, so we can drop that in. So it's, um, it, it, it's the name of the Island that we were, that we work on. So um, yeah. we'll, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Cool. So people yeah, can uh, dig into that and, and learn more. Bruce, uh, my last question, I try to ask most people this question. So you might know what's coming. Um, cause I know you've heard the show before, but yeah. we talk about legacy. A lot of things come to mind when we talk about legacy, but if you were to leave an inspired legacy, what does that mean to you? You know, I think, I think it's living a humble focused life. Um, you know, our organization is not going to be a world vision. It's not going to be, you know, it is what it is. But I, I just think we have tried to make a difference in a small part of the world. And I think that with my, my family life, I think about that in my work life. And I think that in our ministry life is like, we just lead a humble, simple life focused on God. I think um, that's the best legacy that we can leave. I love it. Yeah. Bruce, uh, thanks for the work that you've done in your books and with your uh, school and your ministry and appreciate you and appreciate your time today. Hey, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's conversation, share it with a friend and subscribe to the show so you don't miss future episodes like the one you heard today. And be sure to check today's show notes for all the ways you can stay plugged into the Inspired Legacy, including my free download called Nine Ways to Be a Better Dad. You can sign up for my free weekly devotional called Inspired Inbox. And you can join the private Facebook group, a community of other like-minded men looking to become the best husbands and fathers they can be. So get plugged in. Like, subscribe, leave a review, and help more guys find the show because we need more men battling together for the sake of the next generation. Until next time, live inspired.